Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. Thank you for joining me for another episode in season two of Deep Cuts. If you've somehow navigated here for the first time and you're thinking, what the hell is this guy talking about? I've made over a hundred videos in the previous season, if we call that, it was over two years long. <laughs> um, there's loads of stuff for you to check out. There's artist guides, there's genre guides, there's essentials, there's discussions, there's all sorts. So please go check those out. But if you're here for today's video, I'm gonna do five albums to get you into plunder phonics. Ah, plunder phonics, basically the art of nicking stuff and and repurposing it. So the term was actually coined by a guy called John Oswald, a composer, musician, critic, theorist, who wrote this very interesting essay called Plunder Phonics or Audio Piracy as a Compositional Prerogative. Bit of enjoyable nighttime reading there. In all seriousness, I'll chuck a link down below if you do fancy checking it out, because it does give you a lot more detail than I could give you in a 20 minute video about the nature of Plunder Phonics and this idea of repurposing repackaging, recreating. It also throws up some interesting philosophical notions about the nature of the authorship of music. So who owns a piece of music when it's repurposed? Is it the person that's now changed it? Or is it the person that originally created it in the first place? So there's a couple of those different ideas in there. And if you wanna discuss that in the comments section below, I definitely encourage it. Interesting stuff, but I'm definitely going off on a tangent. So we'll return to that in another video. Oswald dredges up that brilliant Stravinsky quote. A good composer does not imitate he steals. Often with music classed as plunder phonics, the person taking the samples is using only samples to create something entirely different, who tracks just made out of samples, and, and often those original samples sound absolutely nothing like what they originally did in that original piece of music. The plunder aspect comes from the fact that often these were taken entirely without permission. So for example, one of today's records, the Avalanches, since I, I can't even say Avalanches, Avalanches, the Avalanches since I left you, has three and a half thousand samples on it uh, and, and actually had to be delayed on release in some regions because they pilfered and pillaged all these different sounds that then had to be cleared by subsequent record companies and artists. This kind of music creation has developed entirely new fascinating worlds of sound and I'm going to throw out five records today, that's five, yes, yeah, see my hand, that I think you should definitely check out. Before we kick off it's important for me to say that this isn't exactly a genre in of itself, not the same way as like post-punk is or ambient and when we talk about those different genres, this is more of a, a way of a approaching the creation of music. So some of the records I'm gonna talk about today are entirely constructed from samples and others only have elements of them in that kind of elevate or highlight the music itself. So just take that in mind when you start looking at these records and listening to this music. Number one, John Oswald with Plecture, released in 1992, the year of my birth. So since Oswald Boy was the one to first conjure this term in the first place, I thought it would make sense to start with him. Little disclaimer though, as an introduction to Plunder Phonics, this is one of the more challenging records on the list. It's not an easy listening record. There are times where you feel like you are being punched in the face because the music is coming at you so quickly from different angles and it's 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 basically the musical equivalent of whiplash, okay? And maybe I'm not really selling the music that well by saying that, but that's the case. But I wanted to start with John Oswald because he came up with the term. It's very much where plunder phonics begins in a sort of academic sense. So that's why we're starting there. If you think, do you know what, I don't know if I'm ready to be punched in the face sonically, maybe start with some of the other records on this list first. But you know, if you're up for some educating, check it out. Plecture is one of the best examples of Oswald's treatise on the plundering of samples and repurposing. And here you'll either be treated or subjected, depending on your opinion, to the whiplashing effect of multiple genre mashups uh, in kind of whiz-bang intensity. I'm really not joking. What Oswald intended with this record is a kind of micro-history of music which was released on CD over a 20 minute period. So this is about a decade of music leading up to this point. It ends up more as an academic exercise than something you're you know, gonna put on at a house party to vibe to. Uh, however though, if you do manage to go to a house party and put this on, please film it and I'll include it in a feature video. Don't let me down. The sonic intensity of this release essentially smashes through any generic conventions, barriers, uh, it's, it's about as close to music maximalism as you could possibly get because there's just so much here to listen to. Imagine screwed and chopped up vocal lines, high gated drums with reversed bass lines. I mean, Manifold contains U2's With or Without You, which, you know, quite listenable, I suppose, if you like U2. I don't particularly. It's only really included right at the beginning of this track before the first sentimental chord comes in. And it's then included again on compact, which gives you this kind of recurring motif. It's almost dreamlike, although this record as a release is a sort of 
nightmare really rather than a dream I would say and using the beginning of that track without getting the resolving feeling of that first chord means because nothing's resolved it gives you this unsettled feeling and that recurs throughout and I think it's because contextually you know what the music's supposed to sound like. You're waiting for that chord to ring through and it just never does. And that's a really interesting feeling because it start, It makes you start to think about, oh, I've, I've heard this piece before, but in this piece it doesn't exist. And how is this gonna feel differently to somebody who doesn't know you twos with or without you? I mean, who doesn't know that song? And I think that's probably part of what Oswald's playing on really. Uh, but it, it certainly is an interesting thing to think about. You wanna hear the schmaltz, but Oswald isn't gonna give it to you. And I think this is a prime example of plunder phonics. It, a lot of plunder phonics could be really feel good like some of the records we're going to talk about today but this one specifically is obviously going for a more academic intense route into the sampling of music and the notion of authorship there are around a thousand artists on this record i'm not joking a thousand artists ranging from dolly parton to nirvana to guns and roses it will throw itself from psychobilly into slayer into a beastie boys sample into freeform jazz all in the space of about 10 seconds this is what you need to expect as a historical marker of this music i think this is an essential one to listen to please let me know in the comment section if you listen to this and what you thought of it number two the Avalanches, Since I Left You, released in 2000. The Avalanches use so many samples to create something so indisputably their own that to accuse them of plagiarism is pointless. Great quote from a guy who spent so much of his writing career talking about how music slinks into the very fibre of our emotions and our being. I mean, just watch or read High Fidelity for an example of that. Here we've gone from the most difficult listen on the list to the least difficult listen on the list, but that in no way negates the technical prowess of this band in creating this record because it is undeniably technically impressive. Avalanches are an electronic band group from Australia and this record specifically is incredibly important to the idea of plunder phonics as well as being again such a, an impressive technical feat. To use about three and a half thousand samples and end up being able to create a very cohesive sun-kissed face of the summer masterpiece I mean well to say it's impressive it, it would be faint praise. One of the great things about the story of the Avalanches and this record is that Darren Seltman, Robbie Chater, Attell, they weren't really aiming for success on this record. They were just trying to have a bit of fun, but it ended up ultimately being on most critics' best albums of all time list. I mean, in 2000 when it was released, it was right at the tip top of most people's albums of the year. They were crate digging enthusiasts. They loved the process of finding new sounds from strange wayward places and trying to put them into different types of music. Robbie Chater described the record as 60s influenced, inspired by Phil Spector and the Beach Boys, but using dance music techniques. And whilst the opening title track has the flute samples and the pitch shifted vocals, it really does have a 60s vibe. It's based on the track Every Day by the main attractions. It does go off into its own very modern direction after that. The Big Beat-esque opening of Flight Tonight, for example, which segues into a much more disco-induced sound, courtesy of a sample from Sylvester's Rock the Box. Frontier Psychiatrist is probably the most recognizable tune on the whole track for people who haven't really checked out the band before. It, it showcases the irreverent humour of the band whilst also being an absolute unit of a tune. Cinematic horns, western whinnies and a huge beat make up this excellent track and mostly it just further highlights the joy of this album. It's a top to bottom love for music irrespective of genre and it's a hell of a lot of fun. It's no wonder it's been so revered by fans and critics alike. They didn't follow up this defining work until 2016's Wildflower which is a record that I never really enjoyed as much but you know if you've checked this out and you love it this is more of the same thing it just perhaps isn't quite as compelling as since I left you number three Madlib with Shades of Blue, Madlib Invades Blue Notes, released in 2003. Madlib is, and I don't think there are that many people around here that would disagree with me, one of the hottest producers around. The funny thing is, he doesn't always hit the mark. He's a very prolific producer and he's on a lot of things, but sometimes his work doesn't always hit the kind of highs that he is definitely capable of. But when he does, oh boy, does it go off. Mad Villainy with Doom, which I'm sure most of you have heard, Pinata. Pinata? Pinata. It's really an awkward word to say as a British person. Pinata. It just doesn't work. But anyway, Pinata. Sounds horrible. <laughs> Bandana with Freddie Gibbs. Those two fantastic records. J Lib with the late great J Diller. Obviously, Quasimoto's The Unseen, which I talked about in my experimental hip hop video. And of course, 2003's Mad Lib Invades Blue Note, which I'm talking about right now. This is a great example of authorised plunder phonics. Mad Lib was essentially given the keys to the Blue Note archives. He wasn't going around pilfering these from other places. Blue Note said, come in, use some of these sounds 
and and make something of it and you know and if for those of you who don't know blue note is one of the most famous jazz labels ever created and it housed the likes of art blakey wayne shorter herbie hancock and almost every other famous jazz musician you could possibly think of so madlib got the opportunity to invade blue note and do whatever he wanted with these samples and the result is kind of a celebratory history of jazz updated with turntablism and instrumental hip-hop techniques it also includes audio snippets from a history of blue note documentary which only adds to that sort of authorized product feel although that sounds really like I'm knocking this record I'm not at all but it, I, I imagine I don't know but I wonder if Blue Note had asked him to put that in there just to really push that kind of celebration of Blue Note angle that this record has in some ways I guess it goes against John Oswald's vision of Plunderphonics no one's stealing anything <laughs> this is all authorized this is all okay but as with any genre there's a process of reinvention here and Plunderphonics is you know moved quite far away perhaps from what John Oswald originally thought it was going to be and it just ekes out into the process of different types of music different genres of music going into the 21st century and beyond you know so it's not a bad thing it's just an interesting comment or not an interesting comment I guess you guys will tell me also let's not forget this album is fecking good that's the most important thing that I want you to take away from this it's bloody good regardless of the techniques that went into creating it for the most part other than a couple of wild panning effects that never fail to make me feel quite queasy and I don't know if any of you have had that with this record other than that I think it's be very difficult for anyone to not enjoy this kind of funky instrumental hip-hop that we have on display here there's also a real respect for the genre of jazz here which makes sense because it was one of the first exposures that Madlib ever had to music I was a jazz head my dad had a big collection my grandparents had one every time I went to my grandparents house I just sat at the records trying to listen to different things I mean it's something you can hear as far back as jazz cats part one from the Quasimoto's The Unseen record, which also samples some Cannonball Adderley records. I mean, he obviously has this implicit relationship with jazz music that doesn't always come out in the stuff he produces, but obviously on this record, it's here in full force. He's also a true crate digger like the Avalanches guys. In a Spin article in 2014, he estimated that his record collection weighed about half of an African elephant. What? All of this places Shades of Blue as a piece of supremely enjoyable plunder phonics from a master curator, someone who has slaved over records for months and months trying to find the perfect partners to create this record. Slim's Return is the proper opening track on this record and it's a highlight. It uses a track called Book of Slim by Gene Harrison, The Three Sounds, and a KRS-One's Sound of the Police sample as well, and you'll definitely recognise that when you hear it. The heavy percussion line paired with the arranged cover of Reuben Wilson's Stormy, it uses those warm Hammond organ tones and lazy guitar lines. It's just a lovely, enjoyable record, much like Since I Left You. I think you could put this on and, and quite easily just relax into it. It's, it's great. Number four, Girl Talk with Feed the Animals, released in 2008. Those of you who became obsessed with Neil Sisiurga's mouth moods a few years ago, this will be right up your street. Now, a quick disclaimer, and this is probably a first for these five albums videos. This is not really my thing this record. I think it's really important when talking about Plunder Phonics because it really it, it starts to break into that kind of novelty mashup sound that's become very popular and don't get me wrong it's technically very impressive I just never really feel like I'm gonna sit down and listen to an album of this it just it just doesn't really do it for me it's fun once or twice but after that I, I, I struggle to return to it so I've never really sat down and listened to Feed the Animals over and over again it's just not my thing but I still think if you want to get into Plunder Phonics and understand the idea of this style of music or this this attempt at bringing different samples in and, and maybe changing the way we look at music then you should check it out at least to form an opinion of it at the very least but some of you might actually be saying of course you don't feel like sitting down and listening to this record that's not the point the point of a record like feed the animals is it's meant for a communal fun space it kind of touches on cultural markers that everybody would recognize in a group of people to create this joint fun experience where you can all marvel and laugh at the kind of baseless nature of throwing these two very recognizable songs at each other <laughs> that's kind of what this record is I think that's probably the best way to enjoy this record you listen to it with another person or a couple of other people and you all kind of enjoy the aspect of listening to something and, and recognizing all these different things that are coming up you know I can't imagine someone sitting down you know suddenly on the London Underground with their headphones in commuting to work just being blasted by about 50 different pop songs. <laughs> I can't see it personally. And honestly, I can't deny the talent of Greg Gillis's skills on this. You know, 
he does wonderful things on this record. Now he's he's very talented at pushing these things together. These essentially these mega mixes of popular music. I mean, he fuses over 300 samples in only 14 tracks. So yeah, that's impressive. Not in the same intense way as John Oswald, but it's more an immediately satisfying way of melding different styles of music. It's difficult to describe the enjoyment of hearing Rich Boy rapping over a twisted and screwed up version of Avril Lavigne's Girlfriend before a segue into Aphex Twin's Girl Boy song on Shut the Club Down it actually ends up being a surprisingly emotive moment. Or Jay-Z's Rock Boy Under a Bed of Paranoid Android by Radiohead. See, it sounds absurd, doesn't it? It does sound absurd, and I think the absurdity is part of it. It shows off a different kind of talent in Plunder Phonics. It's not kind of the experimental vein of John Oswald. It's not the laid-back vibes of Mad Lib or, or the or the soulful fun of Since I Left You, but it's the ability to develop this high energy, hyper explosion of music from or lots of different decades with these cultural markers all being pulled together like a huge magnet. That's, that's the best way I can describe this record. Let me know what you think about it and whether you enjoy it and whether you've sort of sullenly listened to it on your commute to work, because maybe I'm wrong about that. Number five, One Oak Tricks Point Never with Replica, released in 2011. Daniel Lopatan is One Oak Tricks Point Never, and it's, it's likely if you're a long time deep cuts watcher, listener, whatever you do with these videos, stick them up your ass, I don't really care. <laughs> I do care, don't do that. Um, it's unlikely you won't have heard of him before. I mean, shameless name plug, I did go and sit down and interview him once, and it was one of the best things I have ever done in my career. Um, lovely guy, and he had so much to say about his music. Um, and that probably made me fall for his music even more. Um, I'll link to that if you fancy a read. For the uninitiated, Daniel's music tends to be weighty in its subject matter. He's very experimental, he's done electronic compositions, he's done some great scores as well. He did Good Time, the Safdie Brothers film. Um, he's going to be, well he's done the score for Uncut Gems, which depending on where you live is either been released or will be released, it stars Adam Sandler. Um, it, it, he's got his fingers in a lot of different musical pies these days, now understand why, because he is he is a musical genius in my opinion. Everyone has a favourite OPN record, and to be honest they're all of similar quality, so I can understand why, although ignore those people that say Echo Jams are the best, because they are just trying to be clever it's not the best. For me, his two most successful records were released back to back. 2013's R Plus 7, which I think is a very sensual record. It'll always have a place in my heart. I think it's just a wonderful piece of work. But in terms of kind of scope and overall vision, 2011's Replica is just something else. I'm actually gassed to talk about this record because it's the first time on this channel I've had the opportunity to do so. I don't know how we've got this far without talking about it probably do a guide, I think, at some point to Daniel's music because uh, there's so much to dig into. Replica is a very effective mood piece, that's how I like to think of it. It's fusing samples plundered from old advertisements and commercials, but that's together with Lopatan's impressive synth and electronic compositional techniques. So much of it sounds laboured over, and I mean that in a good way, but Lopatan said in an interview once that the whole idea for it came to him very quickly and it was all assembled in a matter of weeks, which I just cannot get my head round. How can someone be that much of a genius? I think I feel useless in comparison. A lot of the commercial samples were taken from this company called Video Marshals, who bring together all these obscure advertisements from decades long past. And some of this stuff sounds a little bit like Vaporwave and this idea of sort of harking back to the past. And I talked about that in a previous video. Um, read Mark Fisher if you want to find out more about that stuff or watch my Vaporwave video, which I'll chuck through in the, in the description below. Um, I mean, to be honest, just read Mark Fisher because he says the things that I'm just trying to ape off of him. <laughs> and he was he was far more intelligent about this idea of kind of the past and bringing the past back and hauntology and all those kind of things. There's, there's so much there. And there's this morning nostalgia that courses through every single vignette on this record. And Daniel wanted people to think of each track as a vignette, which I think makes sense if you want to think of it as this, this cohesive flowing piece of music, which I do very much think that it is, and that will come across to you when you listen to it. But some of these themes, the death of culture, finding meaning in the old crust of capitalistic detritus. Whoa, look at those words. God's sake, I've swallowed a dictionary. <laughs> Daniel presents these themes in a really audacious way that makes it a deep, beautiful and genuinely affecting listen. On title track Replica, this heartache piano piece is played by Daniel and you can feel every single note in your sternum and the atmosphere is pockmarked with tape effects. You have distortion and delay and it feels quite analog which fits with that retro 20th century 
aesthetic. The dark tones of Power of Persuasion come from a bed of sounds from an old coffee commercial. Fellow producer Al Carson described the closing track Explain as if you are floating through a rainy forest. I think you'd be hard pressed to disagree with that, that feeling that the track evokes. I mean, let me know what your thoughts are on it when you listen to it, but it, it genuinely does have this physicality to it. It really washes through you and, and it affects you. A lot like with Tim Hecker's Rave Death 1972, this record will have even more of an effect on you if you sit in a dark room with headphones and just let it envelop you. Let it do its thing, let it take you off to a different world because that's very much what this record is capable of doing. And from a technical sense, getting to hear all of these different old cringy advertisements and commercial sounds uh, entirely repurposed to create something that is emotive, that is atmospheric, that is dark at times, that's unwieldy, that's so interesting. You know, this is the point of Plunder Phonics. How interesting is that to take something that seems like capitalistic crush, just pointless shite basically, and make something poignant and meaningful out of it? Brilliant. I'm gonna put this record in one sentence. It sounds like the experience of being sucked into a TV and having to navigate blizzards of CRT snow. There you go. You can have that. I mean, it's crap, but you can have it. And that's it. That's my five albums to get you into Plunder Phonics. Thank you for joining. We're gonna be listening to One Oatrix Point Never's 2011 record Replica, the one I've just been talking about, on the Discord on Tuesday at 10 o'clock GMT. Please come and join us and have a chat about that record with us. We, we were all a lot of fun there, although I haven't been there a while, so hopefully it's not been burnt down. Um, but thank you for watching this. We're gonna be having more videos coming out in the next couple of weeks. I'm, I'm doing all sorts of guides. Um, we're gonna have album of the year, album of the decade, which always are interesting videos to to write and and talk about with you guys thanks for watching see you next week <laughs>